We don't apologize for America anymore. We stand up for America. We stand up for the patriots who defend America. Yet what does America stand for under President Trump? Gone is the careful diplomacy of Obama or the forceful promotion of Western values favored by George W. Bush. You make peace with your enemies, not your friends. But President Trump seems to prefer their company to respect power rather than promote democracy. Apart from the summit with North Korea's Kim Jong-un, he's praised strongmen like Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, who applauds death squads. Rep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, who imprisons his critics. Victor Orban in Hungary, who's moved against migrants and refugees. And above all, President Putin in Russia. The KGB man and the reality TV star, both practiced in the art of deception in advancing their political agenda by casting doubt on facts. In regards to who to believe or who not to believe, and who can one in general believe, you should never take anyone's word for granted. Why would you think that Mr. Trump trusts me fully and that I him? He is defending the interests of the United States of America and I am defending the interests of the Russian Federation. In defending what he sees as US interests, President Trump has little truck with the truth. I'm going to tell NATO, you got to start paying your bills. The United States is not going to take care of everything. We're paying for anywhere from 70 to 90 percent to protect Europe, and that's fine. Actually, the Americans pay just 22 percent of NATO's budget. Of course, they kill us on trade. They kill us on other things. They make it impossible to do business in Europe. Actually, the U.S. does billions of dollars of business in Europe. Yet they come in and they sell their Mercedes and their BMWs, and we're the schmucks that are paying for the whole thing. President Trump is undermining the multilateral institutions that stop trade wars and contain conflict. He's threatened to pull out of NATO, called the European Union, a foe. He's drafted legislation to undermine the World Trade Organization, abandoned the Paris Climate Change Accord, and proposed drastic cuts to United Nations funding. He's the accidental president who may owe his victory to Russian interference in the election. And now he has power, he's using it to turn the world order upside down. Well, to discuss these themes, I'm joined by the former chief of MI6, Sir John Sawyers. In Monterey in California is Leon Panetta, who served as US Secretary of Defense from 2011 to 2013 and director of the CIA. And from Washington, Julianne Smith, who worked in the Obama White House and now heads up a security think tank. Uh, Sir John Sawyers, let's just start with the whole idea of this meeting between Putin uh, and Trump and no notes taken. Mm. Or if they were, we don't know about them. We don't know if the other guy was bugged, the, the um, translator. What do you make of it? <clears throat> well, it's a, it's a pretty bad way of going around organising an international meeting. And I've been involved, and I was working for Tony Blair uh, as his foreign affairs uh, uh, advisor. <clears throat> the, the, the fewest number of people you'd have in a meeting like that is a note taker on each side. And I often did that with Tony Blair uh, uh, in meetings with President Putin. And I think that's the norm around the world. Um, so uh, we don't actually know what happened in that meeting. Uh, it may be intelligence sources will find out from the Russian side more easily than from, from the American side. Leon Panetta, it, it could have been anything from money laundering to um, the state of the world. I mean, what do you make of the relationship between the two men and the fact that we have no knowledge whatever of this, the content of this discussion? Well, I think that it's created uh, a terrible backlash uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, of the world and uh, in this country as to what actually took place uh, in that meeting. You've got uh, the President of the United States uh, meeting with, uh, frankly, one of our greatest adversaries, uh, Putin and Russia. Uh, and uh, there are all kinds of concerns about uh, the relationship uh, between Putin and Trump, but more importantly, concerns about uh, 
what Russia is doing in the Crimea and the Ukraine and Syria uh, and the interference in our elections. Uh, what did they discuss? What were the issues that were uh, uh, talked about in that meeting? I, I really believe that uh, the President of the United States certainly owes it to the American people to at least provide a summary of what was discussed in that meeting. We have not heard from the president in any way describe what took place, and that raises a lot of concerns. Uh, Julian Smith, uh, the, the president seems to have very little uh, clear idea of NATO and its importance, and, and indeed, who pays what for what. I mean, naturally, we don't pay for US forces in Guam. Uh, so the, the figures that he gave us were, were, were completely up the Khyber. Yeah, from day one, we've heard a number of claims by the president about the NATO alliance that have been false. He still seems to be under the impression that the NATO defense budget actually sits at NATO headquarters and all countries pay into it like a country club. But in fact, that's not the case. What happens is each NATO member invests in their own national defense. There is a small budget at NATO HQ for day-to-day -day operating costs. But by and large, what we're asking our allies to do right now is to actually invest in their own national defense. And throughout the last 18 months, we've seen the president's inability to grasp that simple fact. And by doing that, he's undermining the unity and the resolve that's so important in the alliance, particularly before a meeting like the one in Helsinki, where the president sat down with Putin. What would have been ideal is if we had had a positive summit where the allies would have come together to agree on our policies to tackle and counter Russian aggression. But instead, the president showed up in Brussels. We had a lousy summit, a lot of divisions across the alliance. And then the president went to Helsinki and essentially gave Putin a big bear hug. So, John, we understand who Trump is. It's very clear who he is. And we pretty well know who Putin is, too. Does it therefore really matter that they are there? Aren't the rest of the institutions and, and the systems of government of the rest robust enough to see them out? Well, <clears throat> I wish, John, you were right on that. But I think President Trump is going to uh, be a very consequential president. Uh, the United States and its role in the world is going to be very different at the end of Trump's time as president, uh, especially if he gets a second term, which is entirely possible. Uh, and I think... Uh, uh, you know, we all object to his behaviour as a human being. We object to the way he goes around uh, uh, doing, doing America's business. But I think at the end of four, or even more so eight years, we're going to see America with a very different role in the world, uh, mm -hmm. that its allies are going to have to be much more self-sufficient, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, Britain or Germany or Japan or Australia. We're not going to be able to mm -hmm. rely on, uh, on the United States in the way we did before. And the global trading system is going to look uh, very different as well. Instead of the United States being the upholder of the international system, it's going to be just another great power throwing its weight around in the world, like China does or like uh, Russia does. And that's very bad for medium-sized powers like us in Europe. We were in uh, Michigan last week, uh, Leon Panetta, and we found that uh, Mr Trump's behaviour in Moscow was extremely popular. Uh, there was no fear of Russia. It was a praise for... Um, for Trump as an individual? Well, there, there's no question that uh, uh, this president has a base of support uh, in the country that is very loyal to almost anything he does. Uh, but I also think it's important to remember that a, a, a majority, a growing majority of Americans are very concerned about uh, the quality of leadership that is being provided, uh, largely because it turns foreign policy on its head. Uh, for 70 years, we have uh, been part of the Western Alliance, uh, part of a group of democracies who share the same values uh, with regards to freedom uh, and uh, self-government uh, and the ability to uh, really provide equal opportunity to all. That's what built the Western Alliance. And that's why we confronted uh, powers like uh, Russia and uh, other tyrants right. around the world. I think today the problem I see is that there is a real, there's a real breakdown between that traditional alliance of democracies 
and now what appears to be Trump's effort to try to work with President Xi and President Putin uh, to create this kind of superpower alliance that can make decisions about what happens in the world. Uh, briefly, um, uh, on, on this one, Julianne Smith, I mean, we have his freelance operations, Iran, Jerusalem, North Korea, uh, where, you know, he's gone rogue, and maybe it works. Maybe bamboozling his way into North Korea uh, pays off. We don't really know. We suspect it won't. But what do you think? Well, I think he's made a lot of promises on multiple fronts. He said that relations with NATO are great. They're not. We know that for a fact. He said that he has succeeded in denuclearizing North Korea. We know we are not close to seeing those results yet. Secretary Pompeo will have to deliver on that. On Iran, he's promised a better deal than the one he walked away from. And we have yet to see any effort on the part of the administration to reach out to the other signatories of the deal mm -hmm. to work on that. And you can go on and on. I mean, he's promised us the moon on foreign policy, but to be frank, we really haven't seen him deliver on a lot of these promises. And so who knows? Maybe we will see a breakthrough on North Korea. Of course, we all wish for that. Uh, but there's a lot of skepticism here in Washington about that. So, John, you have, you have the stirrings of extremism in Hungary, for example, neo-fascism, Austria, uh, Italy. I mean, there are countries that are seeing these populist uh, movements moving, and that's what we saw in the 30s. Is there any danger that perhaps Brexit will exacerbate that? Well, first of all, I think what we're seeing in Europe is uh, a reaction against the um, uh, failure, really, of mainstream governments to address some of the issues important to ordinary people. The, uh, the pressure that uh, uh, immigration is causing on communities, the, uh, uh, the growing inequality in societies, the globalised economy is benefiting the successful and the skilled and the educated, but is threatening the livelihoods of poorer people. And I think governments need to be addressing those fundamental questions that the populist movements have put issues on the table. Now, as for Brexit, uh, uh, I've, I've never been a supporter of Brexit. Uh, I think we're making a... Uh, uh, it's an act of serious self-harm for Britain, but it's worse than that now because we are finding that the two main alliances we had in the world, uh, the transatlantic alliance with the United States and the European partnership in the European Union, we've, we're, we're, we're losing the former, we're losing that partnership with the United States, the United States is, is, is going off on its mm. own direction, and we're divorcing ourselves from the European Union. So the uh, Britain adrift is a, is a serious concern.